So in this experiment, we're going to look at a Herbie by plate urinalysis. So again, this is a specific type of test to analyze urine for um, bacterial contamination. So the purpose of the Herbie biplate is to grow bacteria from a urine sample and determine whether bacteriuria or a urinary tract infection is present and presumptively identify the cause. So bacteriuria is abnormally high levels of bacteria in the urine. Bacteriuria indicates that the patient has a urinary tract infection, a UTI. And urinary tract infections are the most common hospital-acquired infection, meaning you go into the hospital for something else and you leave with um, this infection. So if we look at the anatomy of the urinary tract, we have these two kidneys. They're these kidney bean shaped structures that are in your lower back region. And your kidney's job is to filter out um, things from the blood. So to excrete excess water and to filter the blood. So the, the blood is gonna flow through the kidney. It's gonna have exchange and the liquids and any other waste is gonna travel from the kidneys through the ureters, these are these two tubes connecting the kidneys to the bladder. And so this is our bladder, it's where the urine is stored. And then the urine is gonna be excreted out the urethra and that's how it's gonna leave the body. Now, historically it was always thought that the bladder itself was a sterile environment meaning that it was thought that there was no bacteria in the bladder. But more recent research indicates that that might not be true. There might be some bacteria in the bladder, but again, it's not going to have these abnormally high levels. And so what we wanna do is we wanna test a urine sample to see if somebody has a urinary tract infection. Do they have bacteria? Do they have abnormally high levels of bacteria? And then if they do, the second part of this is that we want to presumptively identify the cause. Remember, presumptive means with about 95% um, 95 confidence. So this will help us to identify the cause. Why do we care about the cause? Well, because depending on what type of bacteria it is, will dictate how we treat the infection, right? Because if we look at, let's say, penicillin, penicillin is going to target gram-positive specifically. If you have a UTI from a gram-negative bacteria, that penicillin is not going to work. And so we want to have an idea of what bacteria is causing the infection so that we can prescribe, as clinicians, the appropriate antibiotic. And so that is what we're going to do in this. So what I'm gonna show you in a minute is I'm gonna show you a video about how urine is collected. And so you wanna watch and see how the labs are gonna collect the urine, and then I'll continue to explain this. So you're seeing her opening the wipes and she's laying them out on the counter. And again, notice she washed her hands before she began. And when you use the wipes, this is talking about for female collection, um, the urethral opening is above 
the vaginal opening. And when you use these wipes, you should always wipe from front to back. Never wipe, wipe from back to front. You don't want to pull fecal bacteria towards the urethra. So notice she collected her cup. You're going to spread the labia and then you're going to use one of the wipes and wipe downwards. So again, from top to bottom. Keep the labia open. Use another wipe from top to bottom. And then a third wipe from top to bottom. And so be sure to hold the labia open while wiping and don't let go before you urinate. Now, notice that when we do a clean catch, you urinate in the toilet first and then you collect it midstream. You want it to be about half full and then continue urinating into the toilet. You're going to carefully put the lid back on the sample cup and you're gonna put it in the container and let the nurse know that you have collected your sample. And then you're going to wash your hands. So a couple things about what you saw in the video. So when you get your urine sample, there's a few things that have to be kept in mind. And one is that you want to make sure that the urine that you're collecting is free from contamination from either the urethra or the skin, right? If you don't clean the skin in the area where the urine is going to pass, if the urine touches that skin, there's gonna be bacteria on the skin and that's gonna end up in your urine collection cup. So it's really important that we clean the area that's going to collect the urine, so clean the urethra well. And so that's why she used three wipes and notice we went from front to back so that we don't pull that fecal matter um, up towards the urethra, which would contaminate your sample. The other thing that's important is that you catch that urine sample midstream. And so you'll notice that the person was urinating into the toilet first. It wasn't real urine. They were just simulating it. You would urinate into the toilet a little bit first. And the reason for that is that even if you wipe the external part, the opening of the urethra is still likely to have some bacteria in it. So you want to urinate first to get rid of that bacteria, to basically flush out that bacteria from the urethra. And so you don't want to collect that initial urine. You want to flush out any bacteria that are in the opening to the urethra and then you're gonna get what we call a midstream catch. You're gonna catch the urine after you've already urinated a little bit. So you're gonna urinate for about three seconds, get your collection cup, put it under, and you're gonna urinate in the cup until it's about half full. And then you take the cup away, and then you can finish voiding the bladder, um, and then you take that collection cup, put the lid on. It's important that when you work with that collection cup, that collection cup is treated as sterile. It was sealed before you began. So you wanna make sure to take care not to touch the inside of the collection cup. So you only wanna handle the outside part of the cup. And so after you collect your urine, then you would screw the cap on and you would give it to the person who is going to be testing the urine. So that is how we get a urine sample. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about what are some risk factors for a urinary tract infection. So if you want, it might be a good idea to pause your video and see if you can come up with a list of what some risk factors might be. Like what would make somebody more at risk for a urinary tract infection. And so when you're ready, go ahead and pause your video and then restart it when you're ready and I will go over some of these answers with you. So if you notice this bottom part, it says 
90% of urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli, 90%. So a big majority of all UTIs are caused by E. coli. Where is E. coli typically found in our body? And it's in our gut. How does the gut bacteria cause a urinary tract infection? Well, what that indicates is that that bacteria somehow gets from the gut into the bladder. How does that happen? Well, think of fecal contamination. So if fecal matter is in the area, that fecal matter is likely to have E. coli, right? E. coli is a coliform. It's a gram-negative rod that ferments lactose to produce acids and gas. So if E. coli gets into the bladder, right, from the feces, and it gets into the bladder, that's gonna cause a urinary tract infection. And so most of the causes of the urinary tract infection are from bacteria that are normally found in your gastrointestinal tract, your GI tract. And so those bacteria get from the GI tract into the urinary tract. And if they do, it's going to cause a urinary tract infection. Because again, remember I said that normally your bladder is not necessarily completely devoid of bacteria because that's not, we're finding that's not necessarily true. But in large part, there's very little bacteria in the bladder. Most UTIs are caused by bacteria from the gastrointestinal tract, from your GI tract. So you wanna keep those in mind when you're thinking about the risk factors for UTI. What are some ways that bacteria from feces could end up in the bladder? And so the first risk factor, there it goes, is catheterization, putting a tube into the bladder. So, if you know anything about catheters, um, in the bladder they use something called a Foley catheter. And so why might a patient need a Foley catheter? Well, let's say that you have a patient and that patient um, is paralyzed. Maybe they're paralyzed from the waist down. Well, they're gonna have trouble with the sensation that they have to go to the bathroom. Their body doesn't get the signal that tells them that they need to urinate. Or if you are female, if you have a child, and let's say during labor, you decide that you want an epidural. The pain is really hurting and you want an epidural. The epidural is gonna work in the same way. It's gonna paralyze you or numb you from the waist down. And what that means is that if you are, if you take the epidural, you're not going to know when you need to urinate. And so, so that you're not urinating all over yourself while you're laying in bed, they're going to put a catheter in. They're going to put a tube up into the bladder and that tube is going to collect to a bag and the urine is going to drain directly from the bladder and into the bag so that you're not urinating all over the bed because you can't feel that sensation. Same thing if patients are, let's say, elderly and they've lost control of their bladder or if somebody is stuck in the hospital and they're bedridden, right, they're in a coma, whatever it might be, well, they're gonna have to be catheterized because they're not gonna know or be able to communicate when they have to urinate. And so, putting a catheter in is gonna collect that urine. Now the problem is whenever you put something foreign from outside into the body, that runs the risk of infection. And so a big risk factor for a UTI is catheterization. And again, this is why this is such a big problem for a hospital acquired infection. Because a lot of times when people are hospitalized, they often will need a catheter because they might not be able to get out of bed. So catheterization is a big one. If you put a tube in, you run a risk of taking bacteria from outside the body and putting it up and into the bladder. 
So that's one risk factor. The next is female. So sorry, females, but females are much more likely to get a urinary tract infection than males. Because remember that I said that most bacteria that causes the UTI come from the GI tract, meaning that the bacteria comes from the anus. If you think about simple anatomy, right, and you think about females, that perianal region, the region between the vagina and the anus, that distance is much shorter. The distance from the anus to the urethra is much shorter. Males have a penis, right? And their penis hangs down. It's farther away from the anus than females' urethra to an, to an anus. And so females are much more likely to get a UTI simply due to our anatomy. The distance from the anus to the urethra is short, and therefore it's more likely that females will get infections. And so if you've ever babysat or you have kids of your own and you have a little girl, when they're a baby, it's really important when changing their diapers, when you go to wipe the baby to clean them up, you always want to wipe from front to back, right? You always want to wipe towards the anus, never pulling from the anus and pulling up towards the vagina. That is not the way you want to wipe. For babies, you always need to wipe them from front to back. So again, it comes down to um, anatomy. You don't want to get that fecal matter by the urethra where it can infect um, the urinary tract. So females would be another risk factor. Sexual activity. So having lots of sex or engaging in certain types of sexual activity um, might make it more likely uh, because, you know, if you're having a lot of sex and there's a lot of grinding of genitals, etc., any bacteria that might be from the fecal area might end up getting into the urethra. Maybe having anal sex might make it um, a bigger risk factor, for example. So sexual activity or lots of sex can um, be a risk factor for a UTI. Infrequent urination, so being dehydrated. You're going to learn when we talk about what's called innate immunity, meaning your body's natural defenses. One of the ways that your body um, helps to flush out your urinary tract is through urination. So any bacteria that are in the urethra, when you urinate, right, because the urethra opens to the outside of the body, when you urinate, you're flushing that bacteria out. You're helping to naturally just flush, simply by flow, flush that bacteria out of the urethra so that it can't get up and into the bladder where it can cause an infection. So there is something to be said for don't hold your bladder. You don't want to hold your bladder because infrequent urination is going to be problematic because now you're not flushing out um, that bacteria. So if you don't drink enough water, for example, you're not going to urinate as much because you're not going to have as much water to be flushed out of your bloodstream and, and into your kidneys. So that's why if you think about like your urine, if you've ever noticed a difference in your urine from when you drink a lot of water to when you're dehydrated, right? If you think about the urine when you're dehydrated, when you haven't been drinking a lot of water, is your urine really pale yellow or is it more of a dark yellow color? And the answer is if you're dehydrated and you haven't been dr drinking enough water, when that blood goes through the kidneys, the water is not going to leave the bloodstream because the bloodstream needs to keep that water. And so as a result, the urine is going to be very concentrated in color. It's going to be very dark yellow. On the flip side of that, if you drink a ton of water, if you're somebody who drinks a lot of water throughout the day, all that excess water 
is going to be excreted as waste. So that water, when it goes in the bloodstream and it goes to the kidney, the water is going to leave the bloodstream through the kidney. It's going to travel down the ureters and into the bladder. And so you're going to have a lot of water in the bladder now, and the urine is going to be pale yellow. So the color of your urine, how dark it is, actually can kind of give you an indication of if your body is dehydrated or not. If your urine is very pale yellow, that's probably a good thing. It means you're getting enough water. If your urine is very concentrated and it's very dark yellow, that might indicate that you haven't been drinking enough water. And if your body is dehydrated and you're not urinating often enough, that is not going to flush bacteria out of the urethra. And so it's important that you drink enough water and that you urinate to help clean out your urethra simply by flow. Age also plays a risk factor for a urinary tract infection. So um, our immune system is going to weaken as we age, right? And so babies, very young, brand new babies, have a weakened immune system because it hasn't formed yet. And at the other end of the spectrum, elderly people also have a weakened immune system. And so if the patient is elderly and their immune system is not functioning properly, they're more at risk for a UTI. And older age is also going to also put you in a risk factor because you're also likely to be catheterized if you can't control your bladder. So age is also a big risk factor for a UTI. If you're older, you're more at risk. And then just like anything else, um, being immunocompromised, right? If you are immunocompromised in some way, well, your immune system is not going to fight off infections and you might be more likely to get a urinary tract infection. And so again, 90% of all UTIs are caused by E. coli. Now, if you think about when we collect a urine sample, right? If we collect a urine sample, one of the first indications that there might be bacteria in the urine is something very simple. And that is, remember when we did, when we looked at the effect of pH on microbial growth, or we looked at the effect of osmotic pressure on microbial growth. How were we, how were we reading out those tests? How were we determining if growth occurred? What were we looking for in those tubes? And the answer is turbidity. So the urine, in theory, if we do a clean catch, there should be very little bacteria. The urine should be clear and should not be turbid. However, if you take a urine sample and the urine is very turbid, you can see all types of little particulates in there. It's very cloudy. Well, if you see that, that could mean that the patient has a UTI. It doesn't mean that it necessarily does because there are other conditions that can cause the urine to be cloudy, um, an excess of proteins in the urine, et cetera. But if we see turbidity, it may indicate a urinary tract infection. And the other thing is, is that they can take your urine sample and they have these little um, like dipsticks that they put in them. And one of the things that they're looking for when they do that is, are there elevated neutrophils? Neutrophils are a type of white blood cell and they are your body's first responder for an infection. So if you have a UTI, you're likely gonna have an elevated number of neutrophils. And if you have elevated neutrophils, that's usually an indication that your body is fighting an infection. And so that's one of the things that those little dipsticks can test for is to see if we see um, neutrophils in the urine. Because if we see neutrophils, that's likely gonna indicate that there's an infection. Otherwise, you don't really have a reason to have neutrophils in the urine, 
right? Because the bladder shouldn't have an immune response unless you have an infection. And so there are several things that can be done initially to determine if it's likely that somebody has a UTI, right? So look, when somebody gives you a urine sample, you can look at turbidity. Um, you can look at if they have elevated neutrophils. You could gram stain um, the urine to see if there's any bacteria in there. There are a lot of things that you could do. One of the big things is to, um, if the patient is symptomatic, to do a urine culture, to actually test to see if there are bacteria in the urine. And so that's the next part that we're gonna talk about. And then one last thing that I wanna add for a risk factor, hygiene. Practicing good hygiene. And again, I said this for females, but this is true in general. Wipe from front to back. Because you don't wanna take fecal bacteria and bring it up to the urethra. So what we're gonna look at now is we're gonna talk about using the Herbie biplate specifically. And so the Herbie biplate is a special type of auger, and it's a type of auger that we call chrome auger. And chrome auger is auger growth medium that turns different colors based on differences in species-specific metabolism. And so what that means is that, remember that the purpose of this test is to presumptively identify the cause, meaning we wanna know what bacteria might be responsible for the urinary tract infection. So, this is going to presumptively, 95% confidence, determine which bacteria is causing the infection. So what that tells us is that this auger must have a way to differentiate between different types of bacteria because there's a lot of different bacteria that could be present on this plate. We could have E. coli, we could have Klebsiella, we could have Enterobacter, we can have Serratia. The list goes on and on and on for the number of different bacteria that could be potentially present. And so what we need to talk about then is how do we know which type of bacteria is causing the infection? And so when we use these Herbie Buy plates, um, these are plates, this is media that we buy from a company. And so when we get these plates, there's a little divider in the middle. And off to one side on the plate, on the edge, it has one line or it has two lines. The side with one line only allows gram-positive bacteria to grow. On the other side of the plate, where there's two lines, this allows gram-negative only growth. So what that tells you is that there are selective ingredients on each of those halves of the plate that are going to select for certain types of bacteria. And so we're gonna talk about what those are. So on the gram-positive only growth side, so my selective, whoops, my selective ingredients on this side are going to be the sodium azide, and we have Phenyl ethyl, whoops, alcohol auger. So ingredient number one is sodium azide. Ingredient number two is our phenyl ethyl alcohol auger, which we call PEA. So phenyl ethyl alcohol auger. So those ingredients are used to inhibit gram-negative growth, but allow for gram-positive. 
And so those are the ingredients on the gram positive only growth side. Again, they're going to inhibit gram negative. And so the only thing that's going to grow on that side is going to be gram positive. So if you think about these selective ingredients, we've already seen sodium azide as one of our ingredients. What test have we done that uses sodium azide as a selective ingredient? And so you have to think about a test that you want gram positive bacteria to grow, right? So not gonna be our coliform test because our coliforms, we want to inhibit um, gram positive and allow gram negative to grow. So it's not a coliform test. The sodium azide was used in the bile esculent auger because remember that in the bile esculent auger, we were trying to identify Enterococcus faecalis. Enterococcus is a type of streptococcus, which is gram positive. So we need to inhibit gram negative bacteria. And so in the bile esculin, the sodium azide was there to inhibit gram negative growth so that enterococcus could grow. Now, on the other half of our plate, which allows only gram negative growth, you can think of some of the ingredients that we talked about in our um, coliform tests because we saw a lot of selective ingredients in those tests. And so on our gram negative growth only side, we have um, sodium sulfite, And so you might recall that the sodium sulfite was found in the endo auger, right? And its job there was to inhibit gram positive. And then we also have oxgal, which remember is our source of our bile salts. And our oxgal um, is going to... Um, inhibit the gram positive also. So these ingredients combined are used to inhibit gram positive. And our BGLB, Brilliant Green Lactose Bile Broth, had the bile in it. Now, one thing to think about in terms of why do we have two selective ingredients? Well, you might remember that the oxgal, the bile salts, they inhibit gram positive except enterococcus. Remember that we use that ingredient again in our bile esculent auger. That's where the name comes from, bile esculent auger. Because in the bile esculent auger, we want only enterococcus to grow. So we have our sodium azide, which inhibits gram negative. We have our bile, which inhibits gram positive, except enterococcus. So that we know in our bile esculent auger that the only thing that grows on the plate is going to be an enterococcus. So if we see growth on that enterococcus or on that plate, the bile esculent, it has to be an enterococcus. And so that's what the sodium sulfite is there. It's there to inhibit. Enterococcus. Because the bile is not going to do that. So we have to have that second ingredient, which is the sodium sulfite. Now notice I told you the selective ingredients. There's two sets of selective ingredients. One allows gram positive only growth. One allows only gram negative growth but I didn't tell you anything yet about why you get different color colonies. The reason for that is that the company that makes the plates, they contain proprietary ingredients, meaning they don't tell us what ingredients are in there that cause the differences in the color change. 
So for this, you don't need to know the differential ingredients, meaning which ingredients cause it to turn which color. Just know that there are differential ingredients in there and that we get different colors of bacteria, different color colonies, depending on differences in metabolism. And so chrome refers to colors, right? So chrome auger, the bacteria turn different colors while they're growing on the plate. And so this is what our Herbie Bi plate would look like. Now, when we do this in class, what we would normally give you is we would give you two unknown urine samples. We have one that we call urine D, and we have another unknown that we call urine E. And so we have these two unknown urine cultures, D and E, and we give you the option if you wanted to do your own urine sample. So if you wanted to test your own urine for a urinalysis, you could as well. So when I go over the results, I will show you both. I will show you what the unknown for urine D and E look like. And then I'll also show you some examples of results that students have gotten. And so we use this chrome auger to do this experiment. Now, the Herbie biplates, these plates are very light sensitive. And so we always tell you when you're working with these plates to shield them from light as much as you possibly can. And so you might put it in your drawer until you're ready to use it, but you wouldn't want it sitting out in the light for long periods of time. So let's talk about the experiment. So for this, um, this would be done in pairs and you and your partner would have either urine D, urine E, or your own urine sample. You would get to pick and we would make sure that we evenly distributed so that we had enough results for urine D, we had enough results for urine E, and then we had some people who did their own urine. So you would have the urine culture and we would have them in test tubes for you and you would want to vortex the urine, so to distribute any bacteria that may be in there and may have settled. And you would use aseptic technique, and you would take the cap off between your pinky and your ring finger, and you would take the tube, and you would flame the opening of the tube, right? Before you do that, though, you would have to flame your loop as well, right? Flame your loop and let it cool. So my loop is cooling. I flame the opening of the tube. I'm gonna take my loop and I'm gonna dip my loop into the tube that contains the urine sample, right? So I dip my loop in there. I pull the loop out. I flame the tube and I put the cap on. So now I have my loop and it has the urine on it. So what I would do is with that loop that I've picked up some of the urine sample, I would just do one broad streak. I would, um, so put the loop on the plate, wipe it off, turn the loop over, and wipe it off again. So you would wanna do two broad strokes on both sides of the loop. Then you, we have a spreader. And in the video on the transformation, I will have a video in there that shows you how to use a spreader. But these spreaders are um, either glass or metal, depending on which ones you have in the lab. And they're stored in ethanol. And so you take your spreader that's in the ethanol and you put the spreader into the flame and it's gonna essentially catch on fire. And that's normal. You don't need to panic if you saw that happening it will go out, so the flame will go out, and then you need to let it cool before you spread um, the bacteria around the plate. Now again, notice there's this little line here. It's a plastic divider that divides your plate. So after my spreader is cool, I'm going to back and forth all up and down this plate. And so again, in the other video, you will see the technique. But basically your idea with the spreader 
is to just make sure and create, think of a lawn. You want to totally fill in that plate. So you would use your spreader, right? And you would spread the bacteria all over the half of the plate. And then you would, um, if you, you could flame the spreader to get rid of the bacteria, let it cool and then put it in the alcohol. Or in some cases, people will just take the spreader that has bacteria on it and put it directly in the alcohol because the alcohol should kill off any bacteria that's on the spreader. And you're gonna flame the spreader before you use it again anyways. What you don't wanna do is you don't wanna flame your spreader and get that metal or that glass hot and then take the hot spreader and put it in the beaker of alcohol. What's gonna happen to your beaker of alcohol if you put a hot spreader into that beaker of alcohol? it might cause the beaker of alcohol to catch on fire, which is not good. So never put a hot spreader into the alcohol. That's really important. So you do this process on one side, right? You put the spreader in the alcohol, and then you repeat the steps again on the other half of the plate. So one broad streak down, do it on both sides of your loop to get the bacteria off, right? So pick up new bacteria one broad streak on both sides of your loop, and then again, using your spreader, spread the bacteria all over the other half of the plate. So you would wanna make sure that you put urine D on both sides of the plate. You're not gonna put urine D on one half and urine E on the other, because you wanna compare urine D to see which gram positives grew and for that gram, and for that urine, you also wanna know what gram negative grows. So both halves of the plate, I'm gonna erase these now, both halves of the plate need to have the same urine sample on both sides because you need to test your urine for both gram positive and gram negative. And so this is how we would set up our urine cultures, okay? We would take the bacteria and we would put it on both sides of the plate. Then after we do that, we would turn our plates auger side up, put them in the incubator, okay? And they would go in the incubator um, at 37 degrees and we would read them out the next class period. And so we would look at what type of colonies um, grew on this plate. So this is how we would do that. Now, in our lab, we would just do this with these unknown urine D and E with your loop. In a clinical lab, on the other hand, if you were testing a patient's urine, you need it to be quantitative. And so if you just use a simple, a standard loop and you dip your loop in the bacteria, there's, or in the urine, there's no way to know how much liquid you're transferring. So in a clinical setting, what they would actually do would be not um, to just use any old loop, but they use special calibrated loops. Loops that will transfer one microliter of urine specifically so that the results of this test could be quantitative, meaning we could quantitate how much bacteria is in the urine sample. Again, in our class, when we're testing urines D and E, this is not optimal. We're just using our standard loop. And so it's not a perfect system. But in a clinical setting, we would use a one microliter calibrated loop. And that would control how much bacteria got transferred onto the plate. So, the next part of this, we're gonna go through day two. So what we would do on day two, which would be our readout day. And so we're gonna look at what our results would look like and what do those results tell us. So let's go ahead and take a look. So again, if we're looking at our Herbie biplate, the purpose is to grow bacteria from a urine sample and determine whether bacteriorrhea or UTI, so abnormally high levels of bacteria, is present. 
and presumptively identify the cause. So when you do this, it's likely, so if you look at this plate on the top here, notice how you see different color colonies on either side of the plate. It's normal to have different types of bacteria present. We're not saying if you see any colonies that that's positive, not necessarily. So you're gonna have colonies of different types on both sides of the plate. You're gonna have some in there that, have, that are gram positive, some in there that are gram negative. What you wanna look for to determine if bacteria is present is you wanna look for the colony type that is the most prevalent and count that one type. Now, if I look at this picture on the top, let me put on the, high, the laser here, you'll notice that on one half of the plate we have purple here and purple here. Are those two purple the same type of bacteria? Answer is no. One side only allows gram positive and one side only allows gram negative. Same thing with these blue colors, right? You see blue on this side and blue on this side. Are they the same bacteria? No, because again, one is gram positive and one is gram negative. So when you go to analyze your plates, you're looking for the one colony type that is the most prevalent. So for this one, it's a little trickier to tell. It could be these white ones on this side or it could be these purple ones on this other side. So if it were me, I might count both the white and the purple to see which one is more prevalent. We only need to see if there's one type that is overgrown. Now, if there are, if you get colonies and for none of the types of colonies, if there's less than 10 bacteria on there, we call that negative four bacteria. Now again, not 10 total, 10 of one type. What that tells us, and I'll show you the math in a minute, is that that tells us that if there's less than 10, there is less than 10,000 bacteria per milliliter in the urine, and we call that negative. That is just some sort of background noise. Could be contamination from the way that the urine sample is collected, right? Because if you tell a patient to do a clean catch, is it guaranteed that they got rid of all the bacteria on their genitals or even the opening of the urethra? Answer is no. It's likely that there's some contamination from the way that the urine sample was collected. And so less than 10,000 bacteria would be considered negative. So that's less than 10 colonies or less than 10,000 bacteria per milliliter. If we get our colony count and it's between 10 and 100, that's between 10,000 and 100,000 bacteria per milliliter, we call that borderline. And what that means if we call it borderline is that it might be positive for bacteria but it might not be positive, it might be negative. At that point, if there's between 10,000 and 100,000, then we're gonna look at other factors to determine if it's likely going to be bacteria. And what I mean by that is, one would be, is the patient having symptoms? If the patient is having symptoms, and let's say they have 50,000 bacteria, right, it's somewhere kind of in the middle, that patient might in fact have bacteriuria, right, because they're having symptoms and they're, they're kind of in the middle. If on the other hand, let's say we had 50,000 bacteria and the patient is asymptomatic, they don't have any symptoms, well, then we might not worry about it. The other piece of the puzzle for determining whether we might call that positive or negative, in addition to looking at symptoms, would be to look at the method of collection. Meaning, was the urine collected by the patient, meaning you instructed the patient to do a clean catch, or 
was the urine collected by a nurse or a physician who placed a catheter into the bladder and collected the urine directly from the bladder because the way that the urine is collected might also influence your interpretation. If a physician or a nurse were to collect the sample from the bladder specifically, there's less likely for contamination from the outside of the body. If the patient were instructed to do a clean catch, then there might be contamination. Maybe the person didn't clean themselves well enough. Maybe they didn't catch midstream, right? There's a lot of places for potential contamination that might lead to an abnormally high number. So again, if let's say we were looking at 50,000 um, bacteria per milliliter, they might look at how was the urine collected. If 50,000 bacteria per milliliter were collected by doing a clean catch, that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as 50,000 bacteria per milliliter from the bladder, right? If it's a clean catch and you have that much bacteria, again, it might just be contamination from the way that the sample was collected. And so again, the physician would then use their judgment in terms of the symptoms when trying to decide if to treat the patient. If you get 50,000 bacteria per milliliter and it was from a catheter, that is less likely to be contamination and that extra bacteria is likely bacteriuria. So again, it's not so straightforward. It's not a yes or no answer. There's a lot of clinical judgment that goes into if they are going to treat possible bacteriuria or not. Now, if we look at the bottom row, so if there are more than 100 of any one type of colony, that means that there's more than 100,000 bacteria per milliliter, and we call that positive for bacteriuria. That means that there is a very strong um, suspicion that the patient has a urinary tract infection. And so in that case, then they would treat the patient with an appropriate antibiotic. And so that's what this test is looking for, is you're looking at your plate and you're seeing how many of one colony type that is the most prevalent do you see. If you see more than 100 colonies, that is positive. If on your plate you see between 10 and 100, we call that borderline. If it is less than 10, we call that negative. And so we'll look at some examples of this. All right, so let's move on. So here's a video kind of summarizing how the urine is collected. Urine culture is performed to diagnose urinary tract infection, identify causative organisms, and to determine susceptibility of the bacteria isolated. However, many women who have symptoms consistent with cystitis do not normally need to have a culture submitted. Only pregnant women and patients who are scheduled for invasive urologic procedures should have urine cultures performed in the absence of symptoms. Common pathogens in the community include E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, Proteus, and Staph saprophyticus. Hospitalized patients and those with long-term urinary catheters often grow more resistant gram-negative bacilli such as Pseudomonas, Providentia, and Serratia. A clean voided midstream collection is ideal. This involves cleaning of the periurethral area and maintaining asepsis. A midstream is necessary to reduce the contamination by urogenital flora. Urine from a drainage bag should never be submitted. Dipsticks can be a helpful point of care aid in the diagnosis of infection. The most relevant tests are leukocyte esterase and nitrites, which are produced when gram-negative bacilli break down nitrates in the urine. The requisition should contain complete information about the patient including collection time and method and clinical presentation.
Please indicate if the patient is currently on an antibiotic. This will ensure the lab performs testing to the appropriate extent. Because bacteria can grow quickly in urine left at room temperature, attempt to have urine reach the lab within 30 minutes. If this is not possible, store at 4 degrees Celsius or on ice. In the lab, specimens should be processed as soon as possible. If specimens are received more than two hours after collection, without evidence of refrigeration, results can be very misleading. Cultures are plated with a precisely calibrated loop in order to obtain an accurate colony count. Blood agar and McConkie plates are used as they support the growth of the most common pathogens. The extent of workup can vary among laboratories. Too much workup can lead to wasted resources and unnecessary antibiotics, while too little workup can lead to missed diagnoses. Bacteria should be incubated for 16 to 18 hours and are examined thereafter for growth. Many people phone the lab to ask about cultures submitted in the evening. The results of a negative culture may be available the following day, but identification and susceptibility will need to wait for the afternoon to be reported. Normal flora contamination is most likely if counts are below 10,000 CFU per mil of a given organism or if several species of bacteria are isolated. Such specimens should be repeated. Greater than 100,000 CFU per mil in a symptomatic patient most likely indicates infection. It is worked up if one to two organisms predominate. This threshold is usually referred to as indication of significant bacteria. The lab will often identify and perform susceptibility if 10,000 to 100,000 CFU per mil is identified and if one organism predominates, but not if there are two or more. Interpretation requires clinical correlation in such cases. We will now briefly go through identification and susceptibility for E. coli and Enterococcus. As with all bacteria, identification of E. coli begins under the microscope. Identification is confirmed using biochemical tests for indole and beta-glucuronidase. Automated machines can be used to determine susceptibility to a broad range of systemic antibiotics, including those specific for UTI, such as nitrofurantoin. When Enterococcus is suspected under the microscope, biochemical testing is also carried out, in this case using Escalin Bio. Antibiotic susceptibility can also be carried out manually using Kirby-Bauer testing. Identification and susceptibility results are reported to the clinician to guide further care. So now if we look at what the different color colonies tell us. So this table is given to us from the um, maker of the plates. And so on side one, which allows gram positive bacteria and yeast to grow. Typically there are four types of colonies that you might find on this side of the plate. You might see opaque cream to white colored colonies and the organism that it likely is would be Staph aureus. If we see opaque pink colonies, they're kind of this pink hue, that would be Staph saprophyticus. So this would be our Staph saprophyticus. If we see these teal to turquoise colonies, that is likely Enterococcus species. We don't know which Enterococcus specifically, but it's likely a type of Enterococcus. If we see small, opaque, white, and kind of moist looking colonies, that is typically yeast. So that could be Canada albicans, Canada cruci, Canada trapicalis, um, glabrata, etc. It's a type of yeast likely. And so these are the possibilities on side one for gram positive bacteria and yeast. It's going to look different on the other side. And so if we look at gram negative side of the plate, so the one that's labeled two, this allows gram negative growth. If we see rose to magenta colonies, 
that have kind of darker pink centers, we're looking at E. coli. If we see deep blue or dark indigo colonies, it could be one of three types, either Klebsiella, Enterobacter, or Serratia. Those would be the likely types of organisms. If we see dark blue colonies, often with this rose-colored halo, you can see kind of this pink color around it. Um, that would indicate Citrobacter, like Citrobacter frondii, for example. <coughs> if we see clear to light yellow colonies with a golden orange halo in the surrounding media, um, some Proteus vulgaris might be kind of blue-green. But if we see the light yellow, Proteus, Morganella, Providencia, those are the likely organisms that that would be. If we see colorless to light yellow green colonies, would be Pseudomonas. So it could be, let's say, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for example. Now notice for some of these, like the deep blue or indigo, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Serratia. There are multiple choices for that one. So what you would do if you needed to narrow it down more is, and we have these in lab, but obviously you're not having these in front of you, but we have a manual called Berge's Manual. And in Berge's Manual, there's a list of how different bacteria respond for different biochemical tests. It'll compare, let's say, Klebsiella and Serratia. And it'll say, you know, Klebsiella is, let's say, negative for motility. And then Serratia has this result. And so what you would do is you would look at the biochemical test and see if you could find a test that would be differential between them, meaning that one of those organisms would test positive for that and the other would test negative. And so if you ran that follow-up test, you could rule out certain types of bacteria to help narrow it down. It's also possible, though, that those organisms might respond similarly to a particular drug, and so you might not be concerned with figuring out exactly which bacteria it is. And so again, that would be left up to the clinician if they wanted to determine specifically which type of bacteria was causing the infection. But notice that in this case, this Herbie biplate, it helps us to narrow down and presumptively identify the cause, meaning we have an idea of what type of bacteria causes the infections depending on the colonies that are on the plate. And so that's what we would need to look at. And so we would look at our plates and see which colonies we see. So let's talk about our calculations and how we would determine if the patient has bacteriuria. So first thing we need to talk about is remember I said that when we add the bacteria to the plate that we would use a calibrated loop and that the calibrated loop would dispense one microliter. Now one microliter, if you remember back to our conversions between units, so if we have one microliter and we convert that to milliliters, microliters needs to go on the bottom, milliliters on the top. So one milliliter is equal to a thousand microliters. So if I take one and I divide by a thousand, right, that means if I have my number as one and I divide by a thousand, is the number going to get smaller or larger? And the answer is it's going to get smaller. So I move it. There's three zeros. One, two, three decimal points to the left. This gets a zero. This gets a zero. So that is equivalent to 0 0.001 milliliters. When we're determining and calculating the number of bacteria in the urine, we are essentially, just like in our standard plate count, we're looking for original cell density, meaning how much bacteria is in the urine. 
So what we're doing is we're looking at um, number of colony forming units per milliliter. Now, how do we calculate this? Well, 0 0.001 is in milliliters. So one over a thousand is the same as one over, um, whoops, 10 to the third, right? Because there's three zeros. So that's one over 10 to the third, which is the same as one divided by 10 to the three is 10 to the negative three. So what you're gonna be doing is you would take your CFUs and you would divide by the loop volume. Now the loop volume is 0 0.001. That math might be a little trickier to do. So let me go through an example and talk about how this works. So notice that in this example, on the gram positive side, let's say you see 105 medium size deep blue colonies. Well, medium size deep blue colonies would be enterococcus. So to calculate that, my colony forming units, my number of colonies is 105 divided by the loop volume, which is 0 0.001 milliliters. Now that math might be harder to do. So what you can do instead is 105 divided by 10 to the negative three, right? We just determined that that's the same as 10 to the negative three. So how you actually calculate that is you take 105 times 10 to the positive three, because if you're dividing by the negative exponent, you can multiply by the positive. So let me put that up top so you can see it's an exponent. So that is 105 times 10 to the three. But it's not in proper scientific notation because it's not a number between one and 10. So I have my decimal point here. I need to move it one, two places. Whoops. I need to move it two places. So 1.05 times 10 to the fifth, right? I started at three and I had to move it over two more. So 105 times 10 to the fifth CFUs per milliliter, because again, this is in milliliters. So 1.05 times 10 to the fifth. You could write this out, right? So let's say we had this written out, 105 times 10 to the third. That's equal to, so if we have 105, here's my decimal point times 10 to the third, one, two, three. Decimal point goes here. Each of these loops gets a zero, which is the same as saying 105, sorry about the pen here, 105,000 CFUs per milliliter. Those are the same thing. So 105,000 CFUs per milliliter or in proper scientific notation, 1.05 times 10 to the fifth. So notice up here, I put a simplified way to solve that, and that is simply the number of colony forming units times 1,000. 10 to the three is 1,000. So that's why we had 105 colonies, which means that we had 105,000 CFUs per milliliter. So if we got that result, would we conclude that the patient has a possible UTI? And the answer is yes, because it's greater than 100,000 bacteria per milliliter. So if this was our result, we would conclude that it's likely that the patient has, is positive for bacteria, they have an abnormally high level of bacteria in the urine, and that they have a UTI of enterococcus. That would be our presumptive identification.
So now, would we necessarily stop at this step if we're doing this? And the answer is no. Um, if there's bacteria present in the urine, usually or often, um, they will also run a culture and sensitivity test. So a Kirby-Bauer method. Because let's say we have an enterococcus, we don't know if it's resistant to some um, antibiotics. What if it's uh, VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus? That's gonna be treated much differently than a non-resistant strain of enterococcus. And so oftentimes, in addition to this, to identifying what the bacteria is, it might be useful to do a culture and sensitivity to figure out which antibiotic would the bacteria respond to. Now, there's a question in your question set that basically says, um, why would you look for lactose fermentation? So what might be a reason that you might look for lactose fermentation? Think about what bacteria causes most UTIs. Most UTIs are caused by E. coli. E. coli or other types of gut bacteria would be what we call coliforms. And remember that a coliform is a gram-negative rod bacteria that ferments lactose to produce acids and gas. So to test for coliforms. Because if we see that they ferment lactose and they're gram negative, well, it's likely that they're gonna be a coliform, which is a bacteria that's from the gut. Makes sense. So this is why we would look for lactose fermentation. And so let's look at some examples um, to determine uh, or to look at the plates that you guys would have analyzed had you been in class. So what you're looking at is on the left, we have urine D. Urine D. And so in urine D, side one, notice it says side one, allows gram-positive growth. And so those kind of yellowish, those are gonna be your Staph aureus. The purple are gonna be your Staph saprophyticus. Side two is your gram-negative bacteria. On this side, those purple colonies, those magenta-ish colonies, are E. coli. So if you're to look at this plate and you were to want to determine if the patient has bacteria. What would be your conclusion just by looking at this plate? And the answer is this plate is definitely positive for E. coli. Definitely. There are way more than 100 colonies there. There are so many colonies that in fact you cannot count it. So you wouldn't have to sit there and count that because clearly that is way more than 100. So urine D would be positive for bacteria, which indicates a UTI. And when it indicates the UTI, right, that means that the patient might want to be prescribed antibiotics. Now, let's look at urine E. Urine E. So we have a couple types of um, bacteria that could be on the plate. Uh, we have E. faecalis, which would be enterococcus, would be on the gram-positive side. We have enterobacter orogenes. We have P. alkaphaceans on the gram-negative side. If I were to look at this plate, just by looking at it, does it look like we have more than 100 colonies of any one type? Answer is no, right? You could sit there and you could quantitate it, but it would need to be over 100. Do we have just less than 10 colonies? Nope, we don't have less. So this one would be considered 
borderline. It is borderline. It's between 10 and 100. And so if this was the result for urine E, then there would be a lot more that needed to be taken into consideration when making um, a diagnosis, right? So again, it would come down to clinical picture. Does the patient have symptoms? How was the urine collected, et cetera? Those other pieces of information would help you to make a diagnosis, help you decide whether you should prescribe an antibiotic or not. And so this would be what our results would look like for our urinalysis of our unknown urines, meaning the urines that we give you to test. Urine D is positive for bacteria. Urine E would be borderline. It's between 10 and 100. If we look at student plates, student samples. So notice that on the plate on the left, would you conclude that that is positive for bacteria? Yeah, likely. And the interesting thing about it is it actually appears that there's more than 100 of more than one type of bacteria. So this person likely has a mixed infection. They have possibly multiple bacteria that are causing an infection. It is possible that they didn't wipe well before they collected their urine. That is possible. Um, and if you want to, you can go back and review um, the tables that I gave you in the earlier slides to see if you can identify what types of bacteria you see on this plate. And then if we look at the one on the right, the one on the right, look at the side one of the plate. You see all these little teeny tiny white colonies? Those are likely staph epidermidis. It's possible that those are normal skin flora bacteria. We can't say for sure, but usually staph epidermidis has little teeny tiny white colonies. You also see a lot of those turquoise type colonies and those turquoise type colonies um, might be enterococcus. If we look at the right side too, those are different types of bacteria. So in this case, it is again possible that the person on the right, the urine sample on the right, might also have bacteria. Because if I look at those turquoise colonies, there looks to be more than 100. And so that sample um, might also be positive for bacteria. But again, you have to make sure that the way that the sample was collected was in fact a clean catch. Did you wipe thoroughly before catching the specimen? Did you catch the urine midstream? Because if you don't, that is all going to affect your result. And so this is just an example of student urine samples to see what students have seen um, when doing this experiment. Now, obviously not everybody's plates look like this. Not everybody has this much bacteria in their urine, but these are just some interesting examples that we've seen. So here are other examples. So here's two more student examples. So if we look at this student's um, plates, if you look on the left-hand side, the gram-positive side, you actually see like really white ones and then kind of more yellowish or cream-colored white. The all white, the bright, bright white could again be staph um, epidermidis, so normal skin bacteria. And the more yellow ones might be staph aureus. If we see this result, we might conclude that this is borderline, right? It's between 10 and 100, and it would then be looking at the clinical picture. Does the person have symptoms? But again, the fact that it's staph, staph epidermidis or staph aureus, those are normal skin bacteria, it's possible that it's simply the way that the sample was collected. If we look on... Um, this other student on the right, 
Notice they have no gram-negative bacteria there, but they do have some gram-positive. And so if you were to count those, again, if it's more than 100, you would conclude that it's positive. If it's between 10 and 100, it would be borderline. And so if we were to give you a plate like this to analyze on the practical, either it would be very obvious that it's more than 100 or very obvious that it's between um, 10 and 100. And if it's not obvious, we might include the number of colonies, meaning we might actually count them and tell you how many of each color. Like let's say this was this purple color, we might tell you that there are 150 purple colonies. And maybe for the blue ones that there are 80 blue colonies. So we would give you the number. You wouldn't be expected on the practical to sit there and count the number of colonies. But again, some of these are obvious if you look at them. You know that they're not 100. Like if you look at the plate on the left, there's two different colonies, the more white ones and the more cream ones. Neither of those have more than 100, very clearly. There's not more than 100. So that would tell you that that's borderline. And so this, again, would be more examples of student urine samples. And so this concludes our video for urinalysis.